When I did my graduate studies at the Middle East Institute at Columbia University's School of International Affairs, I took many courses on the question of the Middle East conflict. Semester after semester, we studied the Middle East conflict as if it was the most complex conflict in the world, when in fact, it is probably the easiest conflict in the world to explain. It may be the hardest to solve, but it is the easiest to explain. In a nutshell, it's this. One side wants the other side dead. Israel wants to exist as a Jewish state and to live in peace. Israel also recognizes the right of Palestinians to have their own state and to live in peace. The problem, however, is that most Palestinians and many other Muslims and Arabs do not recognize the right of the Jewish state of Israel to exist. This has been true since 1947, when the United Nations voted to divide the land called Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews accepted the United Nations partition, but no Arab or any other Muslim country accepted it. When British rule ended on May 15, 1948, the armies of all the neighboring Arab states, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, and Egypt, attacked the one-day-old state of Israel in order to destroy it. But to the world's surprise, the little Jewish state survived. Then it happened again. In 1967, the dictator of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, announced his plan, in his words, to destroy Israel. He placed Egyptian troops on Israel's border, and armies of surrounding Arab countries were also mobilized to attack. However, Israel preemptively attacked Egypt and Syria. Israel did not attack Jordan and begged Jordan's king not to join the war. But he did. And only because of that did Israel take control of Jordanian land, specifically the West Bank of the Jordan River. Shortly after the war, the Arab states went to Khartoum, Sudan, and announced their famous three no's. No recognition, no peace, and no negotiations. What was Israel supposed to do? Well, one thing Israel did a little more than a decade later in 1978 was to give the entire Sinai Peninsula an area of land bigger than Israel itself and with oil back to Egypt because Egypt, under new leadership, signed a peace agreement with Israel. So Israel gave land for the promise of peace with Egypt, and it has always been willing to do the same thing with the Palestinians. All the Palestinians have ever had to do is recognize Israel as a Jewish state and promise to live in peace with it. But when Israel has proposed trading land for peace, as it did in 2000, when it agreed to give the Palestinians a sovereign state in more than 95% of the West Bank and all of Gaza, the Palestinian leadership rejected the offer and instead responded by sending waves of suicide terrorists into Israel. Meanwhile, Palestinian radio, television, and school curricula remain filled with glorification of terrorists, demonization of Jews, and the daily repeated message that Israel should cease to exist. So it's not hard to explain the Middle East dispute. One side wants the other dead. The motto of Hamas, the Palestinian rulers of Gaza, is, we love death as much as the Jews love life. There are 22 Arab states in the world, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. There is one Jewish state in the world, and it is about the size of New Jersey. In fact, tiny El Salvador is larger than Israel. Finally, think about these two questions. If tomorrow Israel laid down its arms and announced, we will fight no more, what would happen? And if the Arab countries around Israel laid down their arms and announced, we will fight no more, what would happen? In the first case, there would be an immediate destruction of the state of Israel and mass murder of its Jewish population. In the second case, there would be peace the next day. As I said at the outset, it is a simple problem to describe. One side wants the other dead. And if it didn't, there would be peace. Please remember this. There has never been a state in the geographic area known as Palestine 
that was not Jewish. Israel is the third Jewish state to exist in that area. There was never an Arab state, never a Palestinian state, never a Muslim or any other state. That's the issue. Why can't the one Jewish state the size of El Salvador be allowed to exist? That is the Middle East problem. I'm Dennis Prager. If Israel just allowed the Palestinians to have a state of their own, there would be peace in the Middle East, right? That's what you hear from UN ambassadors, European diplomats, and most college professors. But what if I told you that Israel has already offered the Palestinians a state of their own, and not just once, but on five separate occasions? Don't believe me? Let's review the record. After the breakup of the Ottoman Empire following World War I, Britain took control of most of the Middle East, including the area that constitutes modern Israel. Seventeen years later, in 1936, the Arabs rebelled against the British and against their Jewish neighbors. The British formed a task force, the Peel Commission, to study the cause of the rebellion. The commission concluded that the reason for the violence was that two peoples, Jews and Arabs, wanted to govern the same land. The answer, the Peel Commission concluded, would be to create two independent states, one for the Jews and one for the Arabs, a two-state solution. The suggested split was heavily in favor of the Arabs. The British offered them 80% of the disputed territory, the Jews the remaining 20%. Yet, despite the tiny size of their proposed state, the Jews voted to accept this offer. But the Arabs rejected it and resumed their violent rebellion. Rejection number one. Ten years later, in 1947, the British asked the United Nations to find a new solution to the continuing tensions. Like the Peel Commission, the UN decided that the best way to resolve the conflict was to divide the land. In November 1947, the UN voted to create two states. Again, the Jews accepted the offer, and again, the Arabs rejected it. Only this time, they did so by launching an all-out war. Rejection number two. Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria joined the conflict, but they failed. Israel won the war and got on with the business of building a new nation. Most of the land set aside by the UN for an Arab state, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, became occupied territory, occupied not by Israel, but by Jordan. Twenty years later, in 1967, the Arabs, led this time by Egypt and joined by Syria and Jordan, once again sought to destroy the Jewish state. The 1967 conflict, known as the Six-Day War, ended in a stunning victory for Israel. Jerusalem and the West Bank, as well as the area known as the Gaza Strip, fell into Israel's hands. The government split over what to do with this new territory. Half wanted to return the West Bank to Jordan and Gaza to Egypt in exchange for peace. The other half wanted to give it to the region's Arabs, who had begun referring to themselves as the Palestinians in the hope that they would ultimately build their own state there. Neither initiative got very far. A few months later, the Arab League met in Sudan and issued its infamous three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. Again, a two-state solution was dismissed by the Arabs, making this rejection number three. In 2000, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak met at Camp David with Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat to conclude a new two-state plan. Barak offered Arafat a Palestinian state in all of Gaza and 94% of the West Bank, with East Jerusalem as its capital. But the Palestinian leader rejected the offer. In the words of U.S. President Bill Clinton, Arafat was here 14 days and said no to everything. Instead, the Palestinians launched a bloody wave of suicide bombings that killed over 1,000 Israelis and maimed thousands more on buses, in wedding halls, and in pizza parlors. Rejection number four. In 2008, Israel tried yet again. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert went even further than Ehud Barak had, expanding the peace offer to include additional land to sweeten the deal. Like his predecessor, 
the new Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, turned the deal down. Rejection number five. In between these last two Israeli offers, Israel unilaterally left Gaza, giving the Palestinians complete control there. Instead of developing this territory for the good of its citizens, the Palestinians turned Gaza into a terrorist base from which they have fired thousands of rockets into Israel. Each time Israel has agreed to a Palestinian state, the Palestinians have rejected the offer, often violently. So if you're interested in peace in the Middle East, maybe the answer is not to pressure Israel to make yet another offer of a state to the Palestinians. Maybe the answer is to pressure the Palestinians to finally accept the existence of a Jewish state. I'm David Brog, Executive Director of the Maccabee Task Force for Prager University. To my Palestinian brothers and sisters, and to anyone who supports the Palestinian people, I implore you, please do not let Hamas brainwash you into thinking it has achieved anything on our behalf. It hasn't. Not in the Gaza wars of 2021, 2014, 2012, or 2008. Each one of these pointless conflicts has been a catastrophe costing us dearly in lives and treasure. Hamas is not a social justice movement, and it certainly does not care about the Palestinian people. It is a criminal gang that only cares about increasing its own power. Israel is not the main cause of your suffering. Hamas is the main cause. Israel is not your jailer. Hamas is. It was Hamas that led you into this most recent disaster. They told you that the Israelis were evicting innocent Palestinians from their homes in the Sheikh Jarrah area of East Jerusalem. It is a lie. The people living in those homes weren't tenants. They were squatters. They hadn't paid rent for decades. They told you that the Israelis planned to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This too is a lie. The mosque is still there. It will be there tomorrow. Say what you want about the Israelis. They are not stupid. They know that if they actually attempt to destroy Al-Aqsa, it would lead to war with every Muslim country. Yes, Hamas take actions and thus look strong next to its rival, the corrupt Fatah party. But the only action it takes is to lead us into chaos. Hamas has no ability and, in fact, no desire to govern. The water isn't safe to drink. The power goes out for hours at a time. Raw sewage washes up on your beaches. The Israelis are not responsible for these dismal failures. Hamas is, and everybody in Gaza knows it. It is Hamas that steals the imported cement meant to build houses for you and uses it instead to build a massive network of tunnels from which it hopes to terrorize Israelis. It is Hamas that makes sure humanitarian aid meant for you is diverted to its favored elites who then sell it for a profit on the black market. And it is Hamas that uses you as a human shield, stationing rocket launchers and missile arsenals in your apartments, office buildings, schools, and even hospitals. Israel uses rockets to defend its people. Hamas uses people to defend its rockets. As for its war strategy, Hamas doesn't have one. It fires missiles at the most highly populated regions of Israel with no specific target. Yet, I know from my sources in Gaza that as much as 25% of all rockets launched by Hamas in May 2021 crashed within Gaza. 50 Gaza civilians were killed by these rockets. Their deaths falsely blamed on Israel. Are you aware of the fact that some of the Hamas missiles that Israeli defense forces failed to intercept ended up exploding in places like Jaffa, Abu Ghosh, and Lud, where Arab Israelis live. Palestinians living in Israel are as likely to be killed as Israelis themselves. Hamas couldn't care less 
and what was gained. Palestinians living in these four buildings in Sheikh Jarrah will still eventually be evicted. A fact that has been known to those families since they sold away the title to those buildings. Think about the even greater number of Palestinians who are now homeless in Gaza because Hamas chose to hide weapons in residential buildings. And when naive American and European NGOs offer millions to rebuild Gaza, who do you think will get that money? It won't be you. The people who really deserve it and need it. It will be the leaders of the Hamas gang and their friends who will add new rooms to their fancy villas rather than rebuild homes, purchase coronavirus vaccines, or provide social services for their people. And the peace you so deserve, the peace which could have been possible when Israel withdrew entirely from the Gaza Strip in 2005, will be even further out of reach. Hamas robbed you of that chance when it set up its military gang then. It's robbing you of the same chance now. No matter how many Jews it managed to kill, Hamas will never be satisfied. It will never stop lying, but you can stop believing its lies. I am Basim Eid for Prager University. The mission was straightforward. Rescue comets going under heavy anti-tank fire. But now the sun was up and our cover was blown. We were totally exposed. I felt a heavy whoosh of air. Then I felt nothing. Just a ringing in my ears. I was on the ground. I could see through my thigh. Even worse, I couldn't see my foot. It was gone. When I awoke in the hospital, it took every ounce of courage I had to look down my leg. Somehow, some way, my foot was there. The doctors had managed to reattach it. We have the best surgeons. Unfortunately, they get a lot of practice at this sort of thing. That's life in Israel. That's life as an Israeli soldier. And that's what I am. I am also an Arab. Sometimes people say to me, Yusuf, how could you fight for the IDF? I say it's simple. It's not the Jewish Defense Forces. It's the Israeli Defense Forces. And I am an Israeli. Are you surprised? If so, I don't blame you. You probably get your news about Israel from, well, the media. They amplify extremists and sell conflicts because conflict sells. Conciliation doesn't. Stereotypes make for simple stories. Too simple. So let's examine some. Let's take the simplest, that there are Israelis and that there are Palestinians, and that each side defines itself against the other. Turns out the fundamental division is false. According to a poll in 2020, only 7% of Arabs living in Israel self-identify as Palestinian. By contrast, 74% consider themselves either Israeli Arab or just plain Israeli. This is typical. So much of what you've heard about Israel is distorted. The story doesn't match the facts. So here are a few. In America, given their numbers, Jews are disproportionately represented in the medical professions. No surprise. But did you know this? In Israel, Arabs are disproportionately represented in the medical professions. Arabs comprise 20% of Israel's population, but 30% of its physicians and 35% of its pharmacists. You've probably heard the stereotype that Jews are bankers. This suggests that they control things behind the scenes. So you may be surprised to learn that the head of the biggest bank in Israel is an Arab. Worse than the stereotypes are the lies. The worst lie is this. Israel is an apartheid state. In an apartheid state, some can vote and some cannot. But in Israel, Arabs don't just vote. They sometimes call the shots. In 2021, as an article in El Monitor put it, for the first time in Israel's 73-year history, Arab parliament members will likely have the final say on whatever a government is formed and even who will head such a government. In an apartheid state, some get an education and some don't. But in Israel, 
Arab enrollment in higher education is exploding, more than doubling between 2008 and 2018. And Israeli Arab Christians actually outpace Israeli Jews in higher education degrees relative to population. You probably don't know these facts because the media prefers to demonize Israel rather than report about it fairly. That may never change. But whether or not they report it, Israel is experiencing an important generational shift. Our parents' and grandparents' generations witnessed major wars. In 1948, 1967, and 1973, my generation and the generation after me haven't seen such conflicts. But we have all grown up under the shadow of terrorist violence, from suicide bombers to Hamas rocket attacks. And terrorists don't discriminate between Jews and Arabs. When you come face to face with this reality, when you have face to face conversations, you realize that everyone within the borders of Israel confronts the same threats. And then you can begin to understand that the real story isn't two groups, Jews and Arabs, locked in an eternal conflict, but two parts of a nation coming together in a process I call Israelization. A silent but ever growing majority of citizens simply want to live in peace with their neighbors the ones across the street, and the ones on the other side of national borders. Like I said, extremist voices get amplified. The media likes it that way. It generates clicks, sells papers, and boosts TV ratings. Unfortunately, stories of good people living and working side by side without strife don't do any of those things. But that doesn't make those stories less true, all those people any less real. The real peace process happens one person at a time. With each passing year, I see that process expanding. It won't be smooth because nothing in this part of the world goes smoothly. But no one is going to stop it. Just like no one is going to stop me from defending my country, Israel. I'm Yusuf Haddad, founder of Together Vouch for Each Other for Prager University. I am an Arab. I am a Muslim, and I love my country. In fact, I'm prepared to die for it, which is why I serve in its army. I don't have to do this. I want to do this, because my country is a special place, unlike any other, free, diverse, vibrant. Yet other countries, countries not so free, not so diverse, call for my country's complete destruction. The moment my country lets its guard down, it will be destroyed. My country is Israel. I grow up and still live in a small village named after my family's Bedouin Arab tribe. Our roots in this land run deep. In 1948, when Arab armies invaded the new state of Israel, my family thought of leaving our village. Some of them did. But when the Jews leaders heard that, they implored us to remain. This is our country. For both Arabs and Jews, they said, stay and we will work together to build it. My family stayed, my parents were born here, made their lives here, start their own family here in Israel. In 2002, I was a teenager. It was a violent time. Palestinian suicide bombers were blowing up Israeli civilians, a danger to Arabs and Jews alike. Israeli troops entered the West Bank to stop them at their source. As a result, many Palestinians were killed. I was torn. Whose side was I on? Israelis or the Palestinians? Is it possible to be an Arab and an Israeli? The question became even more difficult when I saw men from my own village wearing the uniform of the Israeli army. Only Jews are required to serve in the military. No one forced this Arab men to join. They chose it. Why? I asked them. Our home is here in Israel, they said. Our home is under attack. Our neighbors in this home are Jews. They are being attacked. We fight together. Still, I struggled. I went to high school in Nazareth. There, unlike the village where I grew up, most of the Arab students identified as Palestinian even though they are citizens of Israel. Some of the students, my friends, hated Israel. They couldn't understand me. You're a Palestinian, they said. So you must hate Israel. When I said that I didn't, that we had far more freedom and opportunity than Arabs anywhere in the Middle East, 
They called me at Retro. After high school, I went to study electrical engineering at Atkneo, a leading Israeli university. During my first semester, heavy rocket fire from Gaza forced Israel to launch a counterattack. Not long after the war began, I witnessed a group of Arab Israeli students expressing their solidarity with Hamas, the Palestinian terror organization that controls Gaza and is committed to Israeli's violent destruction. Did these students not understand that those rockets could just as easily be aimed at them? Hamas didn't care who they killed as long as they landed inside the borders of Israel. Had my fellow Arab students forgotten that Israel had left Gaza a few years before? That there wasn't single Israeli living there? That day, I dropped out of school to join the Israeli army, the IDF. A few months later, I was a soldier in the Israeli Air Force. After months of training, I was assigned to the search and rescue helicopter unit. Our job was to save lives. We never concerned ourselves with the identity of the people who needed our help. We rescued Syrian civilians wounded in their country's civil war, Palestinian children from Gaza requiring urgent medical care, and countless Israelis of every religious and ethnic background. A life, whether it is Muslim or Jewish, Palestinian or Israeli, is a life. On a base of 6,000 soldiers, I was the only Bedouin, but it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was keeping Israel, our home, safe. We came from all parts of the country and from many parts of the world. We wear every shade of skin color. Our shared goal created a deep bond. Today, I am a student at Haifa University. Half of the students are Arab. More than once, I have seen the Palestinian flag being waved at rally or protest on campus. In Israel, you can do this, because whether you are a Jew or an Arab, you are free. What more do you need to know? I am Muhammad Kabia for Braga University. Why do we spend so much money on Israel? Over my decades of military service, as the Deputy Commander of the United States European Command, and now as a security advisor, I've often heard people make this complaint. The truth is we don't spend enough. We should spend more, and for purely selfish reasons. Every dollar we spend on Israel is a dollar spent, in effect, in our own defense. As a value proposition, it's all in America's favor. Let me explain. But before I do, let me just say this. I can easily defend why America supports Israel on moral grounds alone. I've been there on numerous occasions. It's a good and decent country. Given the neighborhood it lives in, I find that both remarkable and admirable. But I will make this argument solely on the basis of America's security. Our partnership with Israel is unique. Unlike most of our current treaty alliances, say with South Korea, our ties with Jerusalem are not premised on American troops serving as tripwires on Israel's front lines. This is because Israel takes care of itself. America, for good reason, remains wary of any further military engagement in the Middle East. And this only strengthens the case for giving Israel the tools it needs to defend its borders. Here are three things we can do, again, all in our own self-interest. First, the United States should front load its financial commitment to Israel. We have agreed to provide Israel $38 billion in defense assistance over 10 years. That's a big number, but it's also a great deal for America. In addition to giving Israel the financial wherewithal to purchase the weapons it needs, it also benefits the American economy. Under the agreement, Israel must spend these funds on U.S. products and it's happy to do so. Without adding a cent to the total, the United States should front load this assistance to reflect the changing strategic situation in the Middle East, specifically the rising danger presented by Iran and its proxies, Hezbollah and Hamas. An accelerated timetable would allow Israel to acquire critical capabilities like more F-35 attack squadrons, more refueling tankers, and more precision munitions. It will need this hardware to defend itself in American interest against those persistent and growing threats. Second, the United States should enhance our alliance with Israel. It may surprise you to know that the United States does not have a defense treaty with this essential ally. Lots of agreements, but no treaty. We should. Why is this important? Because it will send a loud strategic signal to Israel's enemies that if you mess with Israel, 
you mess with us. Israel is not going to ask us for troops, but we should be giving them anything else they need, intelligence, weapons technology, and other vital information. And we know this is a two-way street. Israel gives a lot in return. Which leads me to the third point. The United States and Israel should build on their already close collaboration in research and development. Israel is one of the most high-tech economies in the world. American investors understand this. More venture capital is spent per capita in Israel than in any other country. Nine out of the ten largest companies have R&D facilities there. This is in a country of just eight million people. When we sell them military gear, they adapt it to their own special needs. The American military, in turn, benefits from these innovations especially in the area of desert warfare. Indeed, President Obama's Defense Secretary, Ashton Carter, made this point. There's no question that American lives have been saved by Israeli technology. There are many cutting-edge projects we can work on together, such as directed energy weapons. This new form of cannon emits highly focused energy to neutralize targets. Such weapons will be needed to counter the spread of cheap, deadly, and plentiful mortars and drones from Iran and other bad actors. All this explains why I find it so infuriating to see Americans, especially young Americans, support anti-Israel groups like BDS, Boycott, Divest, Sanction, that want to weaken and destroy Israel. Putting aside the perverse logic of these groups that we should punish a free and open democracy, it's self-destructive. Israel is on the front line of terror. They, not us, are within missile range of Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, and Hamas. To the extent these enemies of freedom are held in check, they are held in check by Israel. And they ask from us not one U.S. soldier, only for military aid, which they spend on American defense products to help defend American interests. We should get them that aid without reservation. Sure, it costs us treasure, but it saves us blood, our blood. It's also the right thing to do. I'm General Chuck Wald, United States Air Force for Prager University. There are two views of the Israeli military, what you hear in most of the media and the truth. I'm gonna tell you the truth. I was the commander of British forces in Afghanistan. I have fought in combat zones around the world, including Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Macedonia, and Iraq. I was also present throughout the conflict in Gaza in 2014. Based on my experience and on my observations, the Israel Defense Force, the IDF, does more to safeguard the rights of civilians in a combat zone than any other army in the history of warfare. Why is this so? Firstly, Israel is a decent country with Western values run on democratic principles. Israel has no more interest in war than Belgium does. In fact, Israel has never started a war. The only reason it ever goes to war is to defend itself. And it has to defend itself because unlike Belgium, it is surrounded by countries and armed groups that want to destroy it. Secondly, Judaism, with its unsurpassed moral standards, remains a major influence on the citizens of Israel. I say this as a non-Jew. Thirdly, the army is composed overwhelmingly of citizen soldiers. Israel is a small country with a small professional army. To fight a war, it depends on its conscripts and its reservists. These are ordinary citizens, from professors to plumbers, called upon to defend their homes. They don't want to be fighting, and they don't want to harm others. Nowhere was the essential morality and decency of the IDF more evident than in the Gaza war of 2014. If ever there was a purely defensive war, this was it. The war was started by Hamas, the terror organization, designated as such by the US State Department that runs the Gaza Strip. In the first six months of 2014, Hamas launched hundreds of rockets at Israeli civilians. After repeated warnings from Israel to stop, the Israeli Air Force finally conducted precision strikes to halt the rocket fire. And the IDF advanced into Gaza to destroy a network of terror tunnels that Hamas 
had constructed to attack Israeli communities near the Gaza border. The IDF took extraordinary measures to give Gaza civilians notice of targeted areas, dropping millions of leaflets, broadcasting radio messages, sending texts, and making tens of thousands of phone calls. Let me repeat that. The Israelis called Gazans on their cell phones and told them to leave their residences and move to safety. Never in the history of warfare has an army phoned its enemy and told them where they're going to drop their bombs. Many IDF missions that could have taken out Hamas military capabilities were aborted to prevent civilian casualties, increasing the risk to Israeli citizens and soldiers. Despite all of this, of course innocent civilians were killed. Every war is chaotic and confusing, and mistakes are frequent. But mistakes are not war crimes. Hamas, on the other hand, committed war crimes as official government policy. Hamas deliberately positioned its military assets among the civilian population, hiding weapons in schools and hospitals and placing rocket launchers alongside apartment buildings, then forced those civilians to stay in areas they knew would be attacked. They also instructed their people to report the lie that every Gazan killed was a civilian, even if they were actually fighters. And if there were no civilian deaths, Hamas made them up. Numerous internet sites show Palestinians elaborately staging sniper victims, and smashed ambulances, among other phony horrors. It's so common, there's even a term for it, Pallywood, as in Palestinian Hollywood. Ironically, it's the leaders of Hamas themselves who best understand the extraordinary measures the IDF will take to protect innocent civilians. They take full advantage of Israel's decency and adherence to the laws of war. No army takes such risks in order to protect civilians as the Israeli army does. I say this as a professional soldier. I say it because it's true. And people who care about truth should know it. I'm Colonel Richard Kemp for Prager University. Maybe you've heard someone say that Israel is an apartheid state that Israel has a policy of segregating and oppressing the minority population within its borders, like South Africa once did. Maybe you've been so outraged by this information that you have considered joining the BDS movement, the effort to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel until it ends its alleged racist policies. I don't blame you. Apartheid is a great evil and deserves to be fought wherever we find it. But here's the thing, you won't find apartheid in the state of Israel. So, I'll put it bluntly. The BDS movement is a slick propaganda effort built on lies. I think I have the credibility to make this claim. Having grown up in South Africa and having spent a fair amount of time in Israel, I know what apartheid is and what it is not. My parents were raised under real apartheid, where blacks were, by law, separated from whites at every level, from education to drinking fountains. Blacks couldn't vote, couldn't own land, couldn't live next to or use the same transportation system as whites. I remember my father telling me about how my grandfather was kicked and humiliated in public by a young white boy. <laughs> All he was permitted to say was, please stop, little boss. That was the world my family lived in. That was the world of apartheid South Africa. But in Israel, the law is colorblind. Israeli Arabs have the same rights as Israeli Jews. They ride the same buses, study in the same schools, and are treated in the same hospitals. Arabs are elected to Israel's parliament, serve as judges, and fight in the Israeli military. On my first trip to Israel, the group I was with had a Jewish tour guide and an Arab bus driver. 
Imagine our surprise having heard that Israel is an apartheid state. This would have been inconceivable in apartheid South Africa. All these things would be self-evident to anyone who did any kind of actual research, or even better, visited Israel. Something I encourage everyone to do. BDS doesn't want you to research or visit Israel. It depends on the ignorance of its audience. Sadly, on American college campuses, BDS has a significant presence. It succeeds by playing on the good intentions of good people through deliberate deception. In short, they lie. And lies really make me angry because lies empower evil. Lies about blacks empowered apartheid in South Africa. Lies about Jews made the Holocaust possible. And lies about Israel are misleading a lot of good-hearted young people into opposing the only country in the entire Middle East that doesn't segregate and oppress its minority population. Just ask the next Egyptian Copt or Iraqi Christian you meet on campus. So the question people should really be asking is, what does the BDS movement want? The answer is simple. They want to destroy Israel. They can't do it militarily, so they try to do it through lies. They say that Jews have no historic claim to Israel. Lie. They say that Israel treats its Arabs as second-class citizens. Lie. They say that Israel doesn't want peace with its Arab neighbors. Lie. If you tell lies and you tell them often enough, people who don't know the truth start to believe them. The BDS movement's leaders barely tried to hide the charade. They will lie and say that they only want a Palestinian state living side by side with Israel. And then they say this, we oppose a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. Ending the occupation doesn't mean anything if it doesn't mean upending the Jewish state itself. That's from Omar Boguti, a founder of BDS. Boguti lives in Israel, so you might expect that he said this from inside an Israeli prison like Nelson Mandela during South Africa apartheid. You would be wrong. Boguti is a PhD student at Israel's Tel Aviv University, where he enjoys the same rights as every Israeli. My parents could only dream of that kind of freedom. Is Israel a perfect country? No. There are as many perfect countries as there are perfect people. But to call it an apartheid state is not only an insult to the only democracy in the Middle East and the only country with equal rights for all its minorities, it's also an insult to the actual victims of apartheid, like my parents and all those who suffered under it. I'm Olga Mishra for Prager University. Why does the left hate Israel? On the surface, it doesn't make sense. Israel is a liberal democracy. It extends full rights to women, to gays, and to its many Arab citizens. Like all countries which are made up of flawed human beings, Israel is flawed. But compared to most countries, not to mention its neighbors, it is a civil rights paradise. So why does the left hate Israel? The reason is that the left, and as I always emphasize, I am talking about the left, not about liberals, is not guided by a moral compass. It is guided by three other compasses, a power compass, a race compass, and a class compass. Let's begin with the power compass. Instead of evaluating people and nations on the basis of right and wrong or good and evil, the left evaluates them on the basis of weak and strong. If you're weak, you're good. If you're strong, you're bad. Israel is strong, therefore it is bad. America is strong, therefore it is bad. The Palestinians are regarded as weak, therefore they're good. When you're guided by a moral compass, you don't ask who's strong and who's weak. You ask who's morally right and who's morally wrong. Fifty years ago, Israel was not a big issue for the left. Why? Because it was perceived as weak. But after the 1967 Six-Day War, in which Israel achieved a stunning military victory, it all changed. 
Israel became strong, so Israel became bad. And the Palestinians were weak, so they became good. So no matter how much terror Palestinians engaged in, hijacking airplanes, murdering 11 Israeli athletes and coaches at the 1972 Munich Olympics, blowing up Israelis in pizza parlors and at weddings, the left's position never changed. Palestinians good, Israel bad, because the Palestinians were weak and Israel was strong. That's one of the three ways the left judges the world. You can test this theory in other ways. Why is the United States bad? Because it's strong. And third world countries that oppose the United States are good. Cuba, for example, has been adored by the left for decades. Never mind that Cuba's Communist Party has ruined Cuba, that Cubans have no civil rights, and Cuba is one of the poorest countries in the world. Since Cuba is weak, to the left, Cuba is good. The same was true with North Vietnam in the 1960s. It was considered weak, so it was good. The U.S. was strong, so it was bad. It didn't matter that America was trying to preserve the freedom of the South Vietnamese exactly as it had preserved the freedom of the South Koreans. The U.S. was strong, so it was bad. Which brings us back to Israel. The stronger Israel gets as it effectively defends itself, as its economy grows, and as its diplomatic position improves, the more the left hates it. The second of the left's compasses, the race compass, is another reason the left hates Israel. Just as it substitutes weak and strong for good and evil, the left substitutes non-white and white for good and evil. The left doesn't judge people by their actions, but by their race. That's why, for example, the left asserts that a black person cannot be a racist. Only a white person can be a racist. And that provides the second reason Israel is labeled evil. Israelis are considered white and Palestinians are not white. Never mind that more than half of Israel's population is not white. The result? The left essentially ignores Palestinian terror and loudly condemns Israel's responses to terror. Now to the left's third compass the class compass. This is the third way in which the left replaces traditional Western and Judeo-Christian categories of good and evil. Instead of judging people's actions by the same moral yardstick, that of good and evil, the left judges people's actions based on their economic class. Rich people and rich nations are bad. Poor people and poor nations are good. This began with Karl Marx, who divided the world by economic class, not moral behavior. To Marx and to Marxism, good and evil is entirely class-based. Good is defined as workers, evil as owners. And that is the third reason for the left's hatred of Israel and of America. They are both wealthy. As fewer and fewer people perceive the world in terms of good and evil, substituting a power, race, or class compass, for a moral compass, you will inevitably get more evil and more hatred of the good, beginning with Israel and America and ending with Western civilization. I'm Dennis Prager. When I was the Prime Minister of Canada, I was often asked this question, why do you support Israel? My response in effect was always the same, why wouldn't I support Israel? Why wouldn't I support a fellow democratic nation where open elections, free speech, and religious tolerance are the everyday norm? Why wouldn't I support a country with a vibrant free press and an independent judiciary? Why wouldn't I support a valuable trading partner and a wellspring of amazing technological innovation? Why wouldn't I support our most critical ally in the Middle East and in the international struggle against terrorism? In a rational world, in a world where simple common sense prevailed, the question, why do you support Israel, would be like asking, why do you support Australia or Canada? But we don't live in that rational common sense world. So the case for Israel has to be made over and over. I, for one, am happy to make it. Let me start with this. Every military action Israel has ever taken has been to protect itself. Israel is not an aggressor state. 
It's a defensive state. This has been true from its founding to this day. As a fledgling nation in 1948, Israel was immediately attacked by its Arab neighbors. Their goal was not to contain the tiny new country. It was to annihilate it. No nation came to Israel's aid. Not the United States, not my country, Canada, not the United Kingdom, no one. They all thought Israel would lose, but it didn't lose, it won. In 1967, Israel's neighbors again sought to utterly destroy the Jewish state, a nation that had then existed for two decades. Again, Israel prevailed, and it survived another all-out attack in 1973. Those are the big wars, but I'm not sure there's been a single day in Israel's entire history when some act of terror has not been waged against it, inside or outside its borders. There have been two bloody waves of terror, so-called intifadas, in the late 1980s and the early 2000s, when Israelis were blown up on buses, at pizza parlors, and celebrating weddings. There have been incursions from terror groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon. There have been thousands of rocket attacks from Hamas in the Gaza Strip, even after Israel completely withdrew from that territory in 2005. In between the wars, in between the terror, Israel has sought peace with its neighbors, and it has achieved peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan. For others, however, every Israeli gesture for peace is met with incitement and violence. I recount this history for one reason. Any nation that has endured what Israel has endured could easily have become a police state. But through it all, Israel has never abandoned its commitment to the rule of law, to democracy, to tolerance. One-fifth of its citizens are Muslim. They enjoy the same rights as Jewish citizens. They occupy key positions in the nation's courts, press, and government. And they have their own parties representing them in the Knesset, Israel's parliament. To say that Muslims in Israel are the freest Muslims in the region is an understatement. How about this as a human rights test? Prisoners in Israel, be they Jewish or Arab, are well-treated, well-fed, and have access to the best possible medical care. Parents and spouses of these prisoners know where they are and that they are safe. Who else in the region but Israel can make that claim? Through all the wars and all the terror, Israel has survived, and especially in the last 20 years, it has thrived. It's known as startup nation, and with good reason. Key components of your cell phone and your laptop were designed in Israel. A drug or a medical device that has saved your life or the life of a loved one may have been developed in Israel. Yet there are leftist politicians, activists, artists, academics, and college students who devote their lives to denouncing Israel, calling for boycotts, demanding it be cut off from academic and professional societies. Do they denounce the Palestinian leadership that hasn't held an election in well over a decade? Do they denounce the leadership of Hamas, who use women and children as human shields to protect their fighters. No, they denounce free, vibrant, democratic, innovative Israel. With all the brutal and violent regimes, not only in the Middle East, but around the world, how is one to explain singling out Israel for condemnation? Sadly, only one explanation fits, anti-Semitism. Do these haters of Israel question the legitimacy of any other democratic nation, of any nation for that matter? Of course, the answer is no. Somehow, they only manage to oppose the Jewish one. The state of Israel has now existed for 70 years. It is one of the freest, most prosperous, most successful nations on earth. Why do I support Israel? Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't anyone? I'm Stephen Harper, 22nd Prime Minister of Canada for Prager University. I was born to hate Jews. It was part of my life. I never questioned it. I was not born in Iran or Syria. I was born in England. My parents moved there from Pakistan. Theirs was the typical immigrant story. Moved to the West in the hope of making a better life for themselves and their children. We were a devout Muslim family, but not extremist or radical in any way. We only wished the best for everyone. Everyone except the Jews. The Jews we believed were aliens living in stolen Muslim land. Occupiers who were engaged in a genocide against the Palestinian people. Our hatred 
before was justified and righteous, and it made me and my friends vulnerable to the arguments of radical extremists. If the Jews were as evil as we had always believed, mustn't those who support them, Christians, Americans and others in the West, be just as evil? Beginning in the 1990s, speakers and teachers at mosques and in schools began to endlessly repeat this theme. We were not Western, we were not British, we were Muslims, first and only. Our loyalty was to our religion and to our fellow Muslims. We owed nothing to the Western nations that welcomed us. As Westerners, they were our enemies. All of this had its desired effect. At least, it did on me. It changed the way that I saw the world. I began to see the suffering of Muslims, including in Britain, as the fault of Western imperialism. The West was at war with us, and the Jews controlled the West. My experience at university in Britain only enhanced my increasingly radical beliefs. Hating Israel was a badge of honor. Stage an anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian rally, and you were sure to draw a large, approving crowd. While at university, I decided the protests and propaganda against Israel were not enough. True jihad demanded violence. So I made plans to join the real fight. I would leave college and join a terrorist training camp in Pakistan. But fortunately for me, fate intervened in a bookstore. I came across a book called The Case for Israel by Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz. The Case for Israel? What case could there be? The title itself made me furious and I began to read the pages almost as an act of defiance. How ill-informed, how stupid could this guy be to defend the indefensible? Well, he was a Jew. That had to be the answer. Still, I read, and what I read challenged all of my dogmas about Israel and the Jews. I read that it wasn't Israel that created the Palestinian refugee crisis, it was the Arab countries, the United Nations, and the corrupt Palestinian leadership. I read that Jews didn't exploit the Holocaust to create the state of Israel. The movement to create a modern Jewish state dated back to the 19th century, and ultimately to the beginnings of the Jewish people almost 4,000 years ago. And I read that Israel is not engaged in genocide against the Palestinians. On the contrary, the Palestinian population has actually doubled in just 20 years. All this did was make me angrier. I needed to prove Dershowitz wrong, to see with my own eyes how racist and oppressive Israel really was. So I bought a plane ticket. I would travel to Israel, the home of my enemy. And that's when everything changed. Everything. What I saw with my own eyes was even more challenging than what Dershowitz had written. Instead of apartheid, I saw Muslims, Christians and Jews coexisting. Instead of hate, I saw acceptance and even compassion. I saw a raucous, modern, liberal democracy, full of flaws, certainly, but fundamentally decent. I saw a country that wanted nothing more than to live in peace with its neighbors. I saw my hatred melting before my eyes. I knew right then what I had to do. Too many people on this planet are consumed with the same hatred that consumed me. They have been taught to despise the Jewish state. Many Muslims by their religion, many others by their college professors or student groups. So here is my challenge to anyone who feels this way. Do what I did. Seek out the truth for yourself. If the truth could change me, it can change anyone. I'm Kasim Hafiz for Prager University.